Where Hi are there. you? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> uh, I'm in our sunroom. We have a, a sunroom. That sounds yeah, very. A, it sounds very luxurious. Yeah, we have uh, two sunrooms in our house. So this is the smaller one that we've turned into an office, and then the other one is Nora's playroom. So, do you want to show me around? Are you allowed to show oh, me around? There's not much to see. I mean, there's it's not just, much there's to a, see. There's it's like nice. a big, big window, and it's kind of like being in a sauna. <laughs> it it does look. I was like, are you in the sauna? <laughs> Did you just turn it up? Okay, so. Um, I haven't seen you in two weeks and I haven't fought with you in like a couple of days. I did miss fighting with you this week. I do have to admit it. I was like, you so know, my blood, blood wasn't boiling. <laughs> see, that's not, that's not good for our spouses, right? Because then we fight with them. I think they prefer it that we fight with each other and not them. Did you fight more with Mac this week? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say it's more, but you know what? It, it's, what? Um, I think just people in general, or maybe our patience is just wearing a little bit thinner and, and we're just having a, harder time um, being patient and and uh, compassionate with each other just because you know we're, it's just wearing thin I think is I don't I wouldn't say that we're fighting more I just think that we're being probably not as patient with each other as we have as we usually would be as usually okay so let's um, I, I, I this week I've been on my best behavior I didn't uh, start any fights uh, I just I'm even too tired to fight so uh, you are getting me today at my weakest <laughs> look Michael <laughs> is writing we didn't fight this week we didn't fight with this true and I was even surprised as I was like, didn't fight well then I was like okay I have to write Najib because you know I need to fight with him I also am fighting with Alejandro <laughs> via text so I'm fighting with all my friends who disagree with me at this point uh so how are you doing there has maybe been, we what, should we weeks? should start a we should start fight. a fight club a politi political <laughs> fight club yeah something like that <laughs> <laughs> um how um how have you been in the last when did we do this the last time two weeks ago like for yeah. me the days are like it's all one week right <laughs> all one day long a day that is not ending um yeah, it's been two weeks. Two yeah, weeks, right? Two weeks. Yeah, yeah a, lot a lot has, has happened in two a weeks. A lot has happened in two weeks. So I was thinking about kind of, you know, structuring this conversation because we're going to have it more often. The first thing we have to do, I feel, but let's, let's see what the students say, is we have to kind of... Uh, have our insta live sessions a little bit later. I feel that a lot of you are not up yet at 12 o'clock. So here, please, students, write me something. When are you going to bed? When are you waking up? Do you want this to be later? And if it's going to be later, at what time should it be? So we're asking them. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's for me is, is between one and four, because that's one and four. when, when uh, my daughter goes for her nap. And I'm doing the majority of the childcare because uh, Meg is deemed uh, essential services being a uh, psychologist. So mm -hmm. you know, she's working, she's working quite a bit st uh, still. So I'm, I'm, I'm at home but, doing most of the childcare. How is, how is that being at home and doing most of the childcare? It's amazing because, you know, one of the things I've always um, lamented is not being able to spend enough time with my daughter because, mm -hmm. you know, when your children are in childcare, you basically spend a couple hours in the evening and then weekends with them, right? If you're not working on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting to spend a lot of time with her. I just, I don't, it doesn't feel like quality time though, because I'm still trying to work and, yeah. you know, we can't really go out because the weather's not great. and Yeah. There's nothing much to do, so it doesn't feel like quality time. But I always remind myself that really, you know, really, what children want from us is just time, right? Yes, just, that's true. Right. So, in that sense, it's been great. I mean, I, I, you know, I love spending time with her. She is an amazing, amazing personality, and mm -hmm. and and she's hilarious and fun to spend time with. It's just challenging to to work, as you know, when children are there. Yes. I know, but I think for me, it's slightly easier because my children are older, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think right now, Nori is two, right? Um, having a toddler would be so much more challenging because you cannot just tell them, you know, go and read for an hour and write an essay, which I just said to my daughter. <laughs> so, you know. Um, yeah. I, yeah. It's so, the other way around with my daughter. She tells me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> let's start with the beginning. Um, I think today I wanted to discuss a little bit the global south because um, we have spoken a lot about what has happened in, you know, North America and in the European Union and even to an extent with China. And I just want to focus now on a comparative analysis on India versus Pakistan. 
because I have been following India and you get more resources from India. And I, I tried to follow Pakistan as well, but I didn't get in or I got so much less than on India. So um, what's your take on, uh, on how India um, has basically locked down everything with a four hour notice? And then mm-hmm. allowed for this chaos to erupt. Well, yeah, I mean, anytime anything is done so quickly, especially in a country that has the density that India has, there's going to be huge ramifications, right? I mean, basically, you know, shops and stores, etc., was told to close down with like a you know overnight notice, mm-hmm. you know, and there and you know the. One thing what you have to understand about both in Pakistan and India is not just their high population density, but the amount of, you know, poor people they have, the amount of illiterate people they have, the amount of uh, transient workers they have, right? People coming Mm -hmm. from their villages to work in urban centers. India has something like 100 million transient workers, right? So imagine the impact on them where all of a sudden, you know, they only come to to the urban uh, centers to work, whether they're working as housekeepers or food vendors or things like that. And all of a sudden that's not available to them. Right. And also their ability to get back home is gone as yes. well. Right. And we could so what see you've those. done is you, what you've done is basically overnight created a hundred million homeless people. Mm-hmm. And then also many are saying, right. That if it's not COVID-19 that is going to kill them, it is poverty and no access to food. Right? No access to food. Right. The temperatures now in, mm-hmm. in that region are well over 30 degrees during the, the daytime. Right. The heat is, you know, getting to be unbearable, no shelter, you know, all of these things that, you know, we don't really um, have to deal with out in in Canada is is what they're going to be dealing with. Right. So Pakistan's response in comparison to India's was what? Uh, Pakistan's response, I think, was a little bit more measured. You also have to remember, like they the what you have to understand is the geopolitical um, scenario in, in that region. Right. So Pakistan is very aligned with China. Uh, and no countries kidding. like Sh- Sri Lanka, etc., right? Whereas India is not, right? So India and China are kind of at at odds in terms of soft power in mm-hmm. that region, right? So India is going to respond more in line as an as an ally to the West versus Pakistan is going to respond with more allied China. So they're not going to control, do things like shut down their borders to China. They're not going to do things like kick out Chinese. Uh, citizens that or travelers that might be in Pakistan because of that relationship, right? So their response was much slower, much uh, more measured. Um, but you know what? I mean, I think it's interesting in terms of numbers, right? I mean, you know, both Pakistan and India report uh, less than 100 deaths, you know, very small uh, numbers in terms of affected as well. I mean, obviously, those numbers are very low because it's much harder in, in again, in those Test. kinds of in, to test and to um, carry out all of the things that need to be carried out when you have that kind of population density and, and trans and transitory uh, population. Uh, yeah. But still, I mean, it's, it's interesting to note that neither country is reporting a lot of uh, cases or deaths. Yes. But is this, is there, so now the big research question, and I think even doctors do not have the answer for that is, is, a higher temperature, right? And a different climate. Does it temper the virus? And so far, the answer, like just empirically looking at these numbers, looked as if it would. However, now we can see that in Thailand, there is a huge uh, outbreak, right? So that is a little bit scary that maybe there is only a delay in this wave and the global south will be equally affected. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a couple of things I play. My mom is actually in Pakistan. She went there for vacation like she does most winters and kind of was stuck and can't get back. She's um, still there? She's still there, right? And okay. so, you know, my, my, I, yeah, I know the theory about the temperatures because, I mean, that's how we, you know, kind of allocate for flu and, you know, the reason why flu mm-hmm. cases are less in, sum- in summer is because of higher temperature it dies. So I know they're still looking at that, but there's really not a lot of evidence that's the case. I hope that's the case. I mean, considering that those countries are getting warmer by the minute. Um, you know, I, I really think that, you know, stage one of, of the virus transmission is, is travel. So I find it really interesting that all the countries that have had the biggest outbreaks are also can, countries that, you know, have a, a, a tendency to travel more, right? I mean, for Europe, for example, right? I mean, Europe, traveling within Europe, you know, it's like traveling within provinces, right? For yes. us, like there's no border control. Now they've started to erect physical barriers and because they understand, 
you know, that's where the transmission. But I'm wondering, like, you know, because India, Pakistan, countries like that, I mean, their passports are some of the least travelable passports in the world in terms of they have to secure visas for everything, right? So mm -hmm. those countries, the tendency to travel to other countries, also because of uh, uh, economic uh, situation as well, is less than countries, you know, I think the top 10, so really, there's only 10 countries in the world out of 181 countries um, that have more than a thousand deaths, okay? None of those countries are developing countries, none of mm -hmm. them. Okay. Mm -hmm. The closest you have to a developing country that has over a thousand deaths is Iran, right? And you really can't call Iran a developing country. Yes, you can. Right? So, so, you know, that's really interesting to me that, you know, the developing countries all are all reporting less than a thousand deaths and very, you know, low uh, mm -hmm. transmission. So, you know, to me, I wonder if it has to do more. If the stage one is about travel, I mean, China, same thing, right? They attribute the fact that it spread so fast because of travelers uh, during the lunar uh, Chinese New Year, right? So. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if maybe that's the case is just, you know, the, the, in the stage one of the, of the transmission is, is avoided in countries that don't have a tendency to travel as much. Yeah, but then if you also look at how, you know, infectious it is, um, you can also ask your question, maybe it's because there's the testing is lagging behind. Um, and if you die in the confines of your home and you have not been tested, that will not figure into the statistics of the death count, Right. So yeah, at this yeah, point, maybe, we don't know yet. But, yeah, we don't know yet. I mean, it's still early. I mean, so yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I just find that really interesting that, you know, across the board, uh, it seems like, you know, that's the case that it's, you know, the tendencies where a lot of tra the countries where, that have a lot of travel are the ones that are getting hit the hardest. Yes, Andres is writing me currently. He's from Colombia. And I have been watching Colombia very uh, closely because my, also my best friend is right now there. Um, she lives in Vancouver. However, she decided to stay in Colombia for, for, for these weeks. Um, and I, I see the numbers increasing. They're not increasing with an exponential rate, but they are increasing. And that worries mm -hmm. me a little bit. But it's, again, too early mm -hmm. to tell. But now just comparing Pakistan's more measured response to India's, um, you know, full closure response with a four hour notice. Um, do, which one would you, which one do you think was, was better if, if I were to like, you know, very compare it? I don't know. I mean, I, I hesitate, I, I hesitate to say better or worse because like I said, the numbers right now don't validate either. Right. And mm -hmm. it seems like the, the rate is about the same for both countries. I just, you know, I, when I try to, when I see these things, I just try to understand what the geopolitical situation is, you know, and also to I mean, different leadership, right? Imran Khan is not a nationalist or populist, right? Like mm -hmm. Modi is. Um, so the response is very different, um, you know, but they do, they both are dealing with similar issues in terms of, of population control, right? And, and dissemination of information, right? I mean, how do you explain to people who are in villages and don't have access to TV or power, uh, and water about washing hands and you know trying to yeah. trying to educate them right so they, the challenges are the same and I think you know Imran Khan his personality and you know from what I know of him has always been a measured um, uh, type of a person right he, he takes his time and Mm -hmm. um, to do things, and Modi is more reactionary. That's been. You well, know, he, the Modi way that said he that if we don't act now, this would set us back by 21 years, right? So he said we need this 21 days mm -hmm. because if we, we don't do it, we will go back in time by 21 years. What do you think about that message and how it was delivered? Well, I think it's important. I mean, I think it's important that everybody considers has that sort of a message, right? That clamping down as as quickly and as as um, as you know as hard as as the situation dictates is probably the best way we've seen that you know we've seen what happened with the u.s not taking that route well let's, that, let's, uh, let me stop you here let's look a little bit okay. at sweden because i'm, I'm analyzing okay. sweden on a daily basis mm -hmm. because i think sweden is a ticking time bomb what's your take on sweden really being the outlier in europe in terms of not enforcing social distancing or forcing it in a very lax way in terms of still having business open and life kind of continues like nothing would have happened. Yeah, I have a friend uh, actually that I went to high school with that's living and working in Sweden and I've been following his Facebook posts and, you know, like his, him and his wife are still going to hotels and cafes mm -hmm. and things like that. And he, and he made a very, like I thought, insightful post and he said that, you know, in general, Swedish people are very compliant, mm -hmm. right? So the, the government doesn't feel like they have to crack down or regulate them. 
he said in general he's like he's noticing people are observing the physical distancing thing people you know are observing the keeping hands clean and not congregating in large groups even though he's going to cafes and hotels they're virtually empty and people in you know patios are like spaced and stuff so you know they're also not dealing with the population density of the other country so i think a lot of you and i spoke about this before too culture plays a big part right of a culture of a country and how that and how those citizens are going to behave plays a large part and i think sweden is sort of you know put it into their citizens hands to behave appropriately yeah what i think i think there's also a lot of criticism when it comes to the prime minister's decision to do that like if we compare the death rate and the death toll in sweden to norway right you can see it's five times higher so mm-hmm. i'm a little bit afraid of just celebrating this approach because this type of you know herd immunity approach was also embraced originally by the united kingdom and we can see that it really that by the time you realize that it was the wrong approach is too late So um so oh, no, I'm not I, saying I'm, I'm not saying I'm Sweden w- I'm not saying Sweden's yeah I'm not saying Sweden's approach is better or worse that's not what I'm saying what I'm saying is that they're reacting in a way that they think is appropriate for their citizens and their culture and you know Norway responded in what's appropriate for them I'm not saying that's better or worse I'm you know even though it's five times the numbers are still really remarkably low right compared to the UK and other places That's true That, that that is absolutely true. So we will see again we don't know yet. Okay, do you want to mm-hmm. speak about the disaster in America? <laughs> the disaster. I mean, you know, it's we should all be worried about what's happening in the US and Yes. um, you know, some of the messages that are coming from their leadership I think is very worrisome and to me like that is my number one thing that I'm keeping an eye on because to mm-hmm. me that's the biggest impact on us in Canada is what our southern neighbor is doing. uh not just you know from transmission standpoint but also from economic standpoint you know we rely on the US for a lot of our food and goods coming across the border so you know if they don't do a good job containing we have to shut down that border that's going to cause a lot of problems for us in terms of supply chain yes i know and do you think that now the response to you know trump pressuring um you know um the the exporting of of masks to other countries and specifically also canada and then through those response or lack of response does it trouble you because i kind of feel that ford had more of a stronger stance against it and trudeau is not really you know reacting they are canadians are reacting in a very canadian fashion at this point in a very diplomatic you know we will talk about this as the days go by type of fashion it kind of feels that the response is weak no well, absolutely you know and you know I've talked about this many times right you can put on whatever garb you want to get elected right yeah. and have consultants teach you how to stand and speak but in times like this character is truly revealed right and i think it's admirable like Doug Ford who ran on a platform of for the people is actually behaving for the people right so and i think he's going to come out of this if he continues the way he is looking remarkably uh, good in the eyes of his citizens you know going from the approval rates that he had right versus you know Trudeau and you know surprisingly also our premier of mm-hmm. you know, in different ways i think are really failing uh on taking that opportunity to really show true leadership and make those tough decisions even Trudeau being soft on his stance against you know Trump and with the 3M you know telling 3M not to ship masks to you know for me like that is a time to really stand up for your citizens and and show how much you won't tolerate that right you mm-hmm. know but you know that's generally been you know prime minister Trudeau's um way of dealing with things though like right? you know he's not he's not in my opinion not not doesn't show soft power when he needs to. Mhm. Why do you think that's the case? Do you think that he is afraid that this would basically spiral out of control and Trump is not really somebody you can sit down with and have a level have a headed conversation with? Yeah, you know. Cuz we saw how, you know, the whole meeting G7 and everything went, right? They couldn't agree on anything because they couldn't agree on Trump was pushing the Wuhan virus thing and all the other leaders said no way are we going to call it the Wuhan virus so then they didn't come up with any type of global leadership or decision making. Yeah, I don't know if you know the problem, you know, because we don't know how long this lasts, everybody is, you know, weighing their political options, right? The thing the last thing Trudeau wants is all of the work they've done in terms of NAFTA and and, mm-hmm. and renegotiating that to go out the window, right? So that's that's the issue right is that you know 
all of our politicians are always thinking about those about the future right of what the relationship and they should be you know in in honestly right i mean we should all be worried about our relationships you know in the future and how we behave now and how those will be affected but i think it's a tough it's it's really difficult i think for uh, heads of states to to be able to push back um when they need to and not always be concerned about the long term ramifications especially i mean we don't know if this is going to last 3 months 6 months a year right so they don't so it, i don't i don't envy their position in terms of being able to respond yes i haven't have not thought a month or two or three or four months ago that you know i will ever <laughs> speak highly of ford uh and this is that in itself is just like crazy to you know i have a cognitive dissonance right there uh but in comparison let's just do the little bit provincial politics um, what has happened here in the province in the last two weeks and kenny's response i'm talking about the cuts announced on saturday when it comes to education the whole shandra fiasco everything i also discussed with janice and graham thompson what's your thing on that najib what's on happening in the it? province <laughs> well, well you know you can um, break it so down and give me a paragraph for each here's my here's my take okay I think our federal government is slowly doing what's necessary for its citizens in terms of finding financial support, you know, and I think these things take time and you know obviously I'm hoping they're in the background negotiating with the large corporations and the banks and etc to find more supports for us. Uh so mm-hmm. I actually think out of the three level of governments I that the federal government is doing the best job. There's a lot more they could be doing and I'm hoping that they they are. I mean every day they announce something else that they're working on. I think our provincial do you, government Do you do you do you would you like the federal government to release the models and the predictions and the forecasts in terms of the worst and best case scenarios and your confidence interval? I think that's helpful to some people, you know me, like maybe people you and I am like I like data that, and I like to know. Yeah. I I know but you know we always have to be careful with these things and you're because I mean, you know, is it really necessary at this time when people are just worried about how they're going to get through the next month right but is it I, I necessary would... when there are people who are not taking it seriously maybe but is that going to take make it make them take it more seriously i mean but people seem to have some, this we don't know people seem to have this idea that you know when people don't want to look at data and facts and science let's just give them more data facts and science and that'll make them listen but how why do not really how it works they don't want to look at data and science like i i, well, I would assume i'm that. saying the people the people who would be influenced by data facts and science already are they're already tuned in right so just so this idea that you know releasing more data facts and science will make those make the people who aren't listening pay attention i don't, I, i think that's false well, um let, here's the question what it, what, did it what make a more, difference in the us more, what what is more likely to happen is that people will become more afraid i would rather and i think that a more measured response would be to focus on the supports and rolling those out and um and not focus so much about you know um models um you know I, i think we need those models and i think they're they're valuable to to some like people who are reporting on it um mm-hmm. am i am i that worried that our that that our government hasn't released it yet no i'm not uh but for did decide to release it for ontario so why do you think that his approach um deviated from the federal approach Oh, well, we obviously, I mean, you know, whether it's Ford's advisors or it's his, him himself, him himself, they've taken a very different approach. I mean, they're taking a much more uh, progressive approach, surprisingly, uh, in terms of information sharing. And you know, they're building mm-hmm. on and they're trying to capitalize on his uh, on uh, how his leadership is being viewed in this time. And they're going to keep doing those things that um, that they think are going to help him in the long run. And I think that's smart. And he's got good advisors behind him. You know, the question to me isn't you know, I don't think. I don't think it's good or bad like I don't think it's good or bad to release the models and and give us some sort of predictive ability to see what's going to happen. Uh I think that's really good. I'm just saying that I don't think it's a priority. Of all the things that if I if my government told me, "Hey, would you rather us focus on financial supports or focus on this modeling?" I'd say focus on the financial supports. Well, well I don't think they're uh, mutually exclusive. Like look at the US. I think the moment when they released the statistics and you know Fauci was kind of showing that confidence interval some started taking it more seriously. We cannot really say that, you know, having a, a confidence interval that will be shocking to your average citizen doesn't maybe urge them to be more cautious and to really um, you know, uh honor the rules and regulations around social distancing. I don't think we can say that it that. will not affect them. 
No, it's not an all or nothing scenario. Too. What I'm saying is that if the U.S. had, you know, released that data sooner, would the spring breakers not go on spring break? Potentially, right? Saying. Like, uh, and there no was no way, Andrea. No way. You think you? That's not well, human, I don't know. It's not human behavior. Works, Andrea. It's not. Human But again, behavior. spring if breakers. If I made my decision, if I made my decision that I don't give a shit about the welfare of others, and I'm going on my spring break, come hell or high water, all the data and science in the world isn't going to change my But mind. But spring breakers are is a very bad category to look at because these are teenagers. They're rebelling and they're stupid. Sorry if I offended no anybody. Uh, but he great. You offended our whole audience. Great. <laughs> Our numbers are going to drop now. Please attention. leave leave the chat offend, right now. Offended all of our audience. <laughs> When it comes to spring breakers, it wasn't the spring. It was the parents who failed. If I would have had an 18, 19, 20 year old, I would have not let them go to Miami or Cabo or anywhere where they went. Right. It's also a failure when it comes to the parents not stepping in. Like you have an 18, 19 year old who is an idiot and doesn't understand this virus. Then you as a parent have to step in. Right. And uh, I'm reading a lot Listen, of comments also on Andrea, social media. Just one second. Let me finish. Andrea, again. And parents are complaining that they cannot control their children. Children. And I'm like, wow, like that already shows that, you know, you're, it, there is a huge issue. Yes. I think we should stop focusing on demographics. You know, like uh, we've talked about many times is there's way too much focus on demographics. My mother-in-law in her complex or townhome complex was telling me that her neighbors just had a big block party outside because the parking lot's empty. So they decided to like play beer pong in her parking lot. You want to talk about transmission? You know, beer pong? Like, so they're actually taking a ball. Oh, my God. Throwing yeah. it in I never played that beer, dumb game, yeah. And drinking it, okay? <laughs> and these aren't is... teenagers. These aren't teenagers. So, so this is my point. They're not teenagers, okay? These were grown men and women. These are the this. people who need the statistics. Right? They have to know that they are <laughs> yeah. going to die. All the statistics <laughs> in the world are not going to keep them from doing what they want to do, right? These are the people who, what we call the deniers, right? They don't want, they don't want to hear the facts and science. They believe that it's all a hoax. Or maybe the facts and science that they're looking at, where they get their information, is telling them that, you know, comparatively, which I've seen a lot of this, comparative yeah, to seasonal and foods and, and smoking everything. and stuff, this isn't a big day. You have, like, less chance of getting this than winning the lottery and all this stuff that they, that information that they believe. And I've seen this because I have these people in my, in my social feeds posting up this information. That's where they Why do you have these people in your social feeds in the first place? I'm joking. So what well, are they I, I try very coming. hard to make sure that my, my information <laughs> doesn't come from a silo of people who think like me. Just like your reason for watching... So you're listening to Fox News. Yeah, like, I, I listen to, to Fox News. I talk. listen to Fox News in my car. I only listen to Fox News. I rarely turn to CNN because CNN mm -hmm. is just as biased as Fox News. And so I'd like to hear and understand where mm -hmm. people who listen to Fox News, where they get their information from and how that works, right? So, you know, I try very hard. I've tried very hard to make sure my algorithms don't just give me the progressive liberal stuff that they think I want to hear. I agree. Okay. Um, Next topic, where were we? The U.S. and the U.S. affecting us. Um, do you want to do? Do we want to talk about elections? Uh, I've been watching lately, of course, Bernie and Biden's response as well. There was some um, news about Cuomo should be the Democratic candidate because he's doing <laughs> such a great job. What's your take on that? Uh, the the Cuomo is doing a great job, Governor. Do Cuomo is you know, doing a great job. Yeah, yes. you know, and you know, he's very comparative to uh, Doug, what Doug Ford's doing, right? Being Do you very... think the Democrats need somebody like Cuomo? No, I don't. I, Why? You Why know not? What? Um, I don't know. I mean, I have to give that some thought. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, I've really been looking at Bernie's responses versus Biden's lack of responses. So um, I haven't really even given a given a thought of like Cuomo entering the race. Well, who knows? Maybe. Well, is, that a, is there an opportunity for Cuomo entering the race? I think he rejected that, that idea. He said that will not happen. I mean, it depends what happens, right? I mean, the DNC convention has been delayed it's twice postponed. now, right? Yeah, it's yeah. So postponed to August? Yeah, it was delayed to July and now it's delayed to August, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, anything, anything can happen. You know, I mean, mm. like maybe, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's going to come to an appointee. Like, I think the DNC is going to say, hey, we don't have time, especially if the election date's not changed, right? Mm -hmm. So the DNC will be in a position to say, we don't have time to keep doing primaries or have the election. Committee. We're just going to appoint a nominee. So, so do you think that the, you know, the elect, that the, the delegates are going to vote again and it will be like a contested convention and then everybody could recast their vote or what, how would that look like? I have no idea. I mean, I think that 
you know, more and more it's making sense for them to just have a mail-in ballot or, well, mail-in they probably can't even do now either. So I don't know how they would do it. So, um, you know, the delegates that already have been selected, maybe maybe what they might do is just put it in the hands of the super delegates. What about uh, the thought of uh, Biden electing or having um, the vice presidential uh, nominee for Mission Against Governor, Gretchen, uh, what's her name? Have you heard of that? No, I didn't hear that. So is he he's hinting that he has he's picked a VP nominee? Yeah, that he that would be her, his 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 VP nominee. You know, Michigan's governor and Michigan has now mm -hmm. a huge problem. Trump was talking in his uh, usual misogynistic ways about her, right? And mm -hmm. apparently she might be the VP choice, which would be a smart choice in the context that he needs Michigan. So the Midwest path is still an important path if Biden is a nominee and if Michigan is faring poorly and the governor has high approval ratings, having her as a VIP could be a great strategy, definitely of winning Michigan back. I think that the reason why we're not hearing much from Biden is I think that some of these allegation accusations against him, which are all speculative, by the way, nothing has been proven. Um, I think that... Um, those are become, if they become, if they do get some traction and some validity, those are going to become a huge issue for him. So, I mean, obviously it makes sense for him to pick a female uh, VP, but um, I think there's probably some serious conversations happening about whether or not he would be a viable candidate. We will see. Now everything is up in the air. Um, yep. Let's go back a little bit to Canada and the conservative leadership race and Peter McKay and, you know, his him pushing for for the show must go on. What was your take on that? Was that there's really bad decision making because uh, it really backfired and it didn't really serve him uh, in the least? Do you think the conservative leadership race should go on because now it feels as though there is absolutely no opposition to the liberals like she is still talking <laughs> um, representing the opposition, but of course, like you know, there are issues with that. What's your take on that? No, it was sh it was sheer stupidity to keep continuing the race, uh, even as long as they did. Right in the middle of a pandemic, the last thing people need. I was getting three emails, three to six emails a day, three to six phone calls a day from you know the leaders or the the candidates, right, calling me for their votes and also emails. Were from you the getting it really? I, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't get any of that. Yeah, well, I mean, you're probably not on their radar, right? So, but I am. So, um, and, you know, and also, you know, at the party asking me for money, you know, it's very tone deaf in the middle of a pandemic to be asking people for money and votes for yeah. a leadership campaign, especially an elitist leadership campaign like the one that they were running. Mm -hmm. So they were way, way behind in terms of calling it off. Uh, the thing that I think is interesting that you guys can look up is that there was a poll done just before they called it off um, by a by a polling company that, you know, ac accurately predicted uh, sheer winning last time that the the um, uh, the lady I can't remember her name now in Ontario the 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 female uh, black um, lady that she was gonna that she, they were predicting her to win and they were predicting McKay to be in third or fourth place. Oh really? So it's, inter so it's interesting to me that they called it off like right after that poll came out, right? I mean, mm -hmm. to me, it's just like oh shit. <laughs> Our guy might not win. We better call this. Well, thing but off. I do think that Peter McKay didn't uh, do himself a service with, you know, I don't know if you saw his Twitter with the phone and democracy calling. So, like the campaign, the messaging was totally tone deaf, you know, and then also that interview with, I think, was it with CTV or Globe? I don't remember. Global. Um, where he basically, they, he was asked like, well, you know, currently, you know, we have a global pandemic, like that should be a problem, right? And then his answer was, well, is it? So what's your take on that? Do you think that he kind of uh, shot himself in the foot? Oh, yeah, from day uh, one, I mean, from day one. But that, uh, would this mean that we are done and he will not win the leadership race, not even in the future? I think it's hard to say at this point. I mean, it depends on what happens in terms of how long this pan, uh, pandemic lasts and what mm -hmm. how Trudeau uh, I mean, the reason why I mean they've also stopped the talk about bringing down the Trudeau government etc cetera, etc cetera, because now is not the time to have those conversations I think in how Trudeau handles himself during this how the approval rating and polling looks afterwards like I think that'll determine I'd be very surprised if they start up the leadership race again um, you know before the fall at the earliest right so uh, I think everything has changed. And, you know, by that time, who knows if the same people will still be interested in running. I mean, oh, yeah. You, you think know. that there might be new actors entering the stage? 
there might be new actors there might mm. be some people dropping off you know if mm-hmm. i was mckay i would seriously reconsider still running i mean you know from day one i mean all he did it was his race to lose and he did everything he could to make sure that he'd lose it right yeah i agree so uh scots and alberta and where are, where are all prices right now i haven't checked lately last time i checked was three bucks and some change Okay, so Starbucks coffee is more expensive. So no. um, toilet paper is toilet paper is more expensive. <laughs> we need a bidet. Um, But you know, I mean, and seriously, I mean, you yeah. know, like, I hope people, many people don't realize it costs seven dollars a barrel to ship it. So we lose money mm-hmm. every barrel we ship. So, what's your take on the new pipeline uh, and the announcement on the Saturday cuts two weeks ago or ten days ago? When was that? Um, and everything that has happened on a provincial level. Here's my take. So, if you're going to invest in a pipeline, Keystone XL is the one to invest in. Not the one that okay. goes to the US. <laughs> Not the one that go No, that is the one that goes to the US. Oh, that one. Yeah. Keystone. Keystone is the one that Kenny oh, has invested oh, okay. in. Okay. So that's what you think that I think that's a smart in? So, forget the scenario we're in right now. Let's say all things being equal, if you were to invest in a pipeline, that's your smartest bet for two reasons. One is the the fact that the US has always bought 97% or something of our our crude and to cr- increase our capacity to them makes sense because we know that we have that customer i mean even the fact that i mean all we're doing is shipping it down to the gulf they're refining it and selling it back to us in a lot of cases at least the fact that they they have the ability to do that i mean the the you know the, the reality is that even if we started building refineries today they wouldn't be operational for 3 to 5 years right so if we have that customer who has that demand especially now that it looks like their shale is 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 not going to be have the demand that it was I mean thanks to to Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. it makes sense it makes sense that if we can make money at it to increase our capacity to our biggest customer people don't even realize you know wait wait but there is there is criticism when it comes to that and the criticism Hold on a is second. so people don't realize price. that even Trans Mountain which is the pipeline that the federal government invested in that goes out to Kitimat in BC most of that oil ships down to California and ships to the Gulf Coast for refining and to Texas mm-hmm. to refine it right mm-hmm. people don't realize that because that port cannot accommodate the giant tankers that are required to ship overseas right it's not deep enough so people don't even realize that right so we we always get sold a bill of goods about the oh we got to get to tidewater tidewater well two problems one is <laughs> even if we get it to where they want to take it to we can't get the the right size tankers to take it over tankers the economics aren't there if you take in the small tankers second piece is still nobody can tell me why would china or india or all these customers buy our crude they're not in the refining business they get refined sweet ready to use oil from saudi arabia and other countries who who is our customer for crude other than the us nobody can still tell me that so keystone is actually a very good investment if you're going to invest in a mm-hmm. pipeline and increase your capacity now to do it at this time is the problem that's what i wanted to say that there's first of all a lot of criticism that he's doing it right now right because there will be the lag of 3 years uh uh where this will pay off so what's your take on um the saturday scots when it comes to education Well, it just it boggles my mind to be so short-term thinking and so stubborn that you're still trying to execute a budget that was put together pre-pandemic. Like to me, it's just like I don't understand where that thinking is going to. Even to suspend it, no one is going to hold you to. This is the time for any mm-hmm. government, any leader, to make decisions that nobody is going to hold you to to later. They're going to know that your interest. your decisions are based on current circumstances you know like somebody was saying like you know the fact that quebec has offered a bonus to their healthcare workers oh those healthcare workers are going to want that sal- same salary later no they're not you know what mm-hmm. i mean like these are special yeah. emergency circumstances stop acting like every decision we make now is forever it isn't right so premier kenny could look like doug ford and be just like listen everything we put forth in the budget in in march we didn't know this was going to happen we're going back so we to the to drawing board it. Yeah because okay first tell yep. me this you know I go I keep going to the Alberta you know government Alberta website there's nothing being done other than that $1100 emergency response which by the way 80 it's, less than isn't it closed it's over it's over it's over yes i'm saying it's 80, closed and you're less than 80,000 people qualified are you kidding me i don't We're know a single person then. who qualified oh for that benefit less than 80,000 mm. people qualified and everything else is all they're talking about is deferrals deferrals and loans 
the last thing people need right now is deferrals and loans. Like, and this is both our municipal government and our provincial government. All they keep talking about is deferrals and loans. The last thing people need right now is more debt. Okay, so yeah. this is such short-term thinking. And compounded right? interest. And compounded interest. And I think that, you know, again, just like Peter McKay, uh, Premier Kenny's putting himself in a place that, you know, where he was almost guaranteed a second mandate, that is now looking like at risk. And if he keeps going the way that he is, that he's going. You think this would uh, endanger his re-election? Well, I mean, like, like I said, you know, again, what people don't realize is how behavior changes, how election, um, um, how elections and, and leadership races change. It depends how long this thing lasts. You know what well, I mean? It depends yes. how much how much pressure people are put in under, right? I don't think we've hit that tipping point no. yet where, right, where people's behavior, you know, I, I just laugh when people are like, oh, this is going to change the working world. Everybody's going to work from home. No, they're not. This isn't reality. What we're, mm. how we're working from home right now is not real life. You it's not I mean? sustainable and it's also and, kind exactly. of divides the haves and have nots. Exactly. Like working from you know, home so is a luxury. What is going to change human like behavior it's... and change, yeah, what is going to change human behavior, make significant change in societies, depends how long this lasts and what the impact is on individuals, right? If everything were to go back to normal tomorrow, everything will go back to exactly how it was before, right? Because the impact isn't there. People are going to put their heads down and try to get their lives back together, right? But if this lasts six months, eight months, nine months, a year, where now I'm significantly suffering because of my poor leadership, that change, because of the poor leaders that we have, then that changes everything. What's your take on the whole Chandra fiasco? Which fiasco, sorry? The Tyler Chandra fiasco. You know, it, it's so funny because, you know, I did an analysis on CBC about all of the ministers after they were selected. And, you know, I, I thought that Tyler Chandra would be like one of the least impactful or, you know, least worrisome of all the ministers. But right me, now like, he's, he's very, yeah. uh, what's the word for his, infamous? Infamous, right? But, you know, this goes to show you, right? You can't judge a book by its cover, right? Like, I thought, you know, like, you know, this guy looks like, you know, he's going to be pretty safe bed. And that's why Kenny probably <laughs> picked him, right? To pick, to head such a huge portfolio. And, did you judge you know, him on looks or did you judge him on no, on his background. performance or just on background? Okay. On background as well, mm -hmm. right? And I thought, okay, you know, he's probably a safe choice because, you know, the high visibility portfolios, you want to pick the safest people, right? You pick an Amarjeet Sohi, right? Who knows, who's politically savvy, right? And you, you know, when you give him large portfolios. So I thought, okay, he must, you know, and then, you know, for him to do the kind of things that he did, I actually know Dr. Zaidi, right? And, and you know, he's mm -hmm. a very patient and understanding individual, right? To do these kinds of things is just silly. It shows me like, you know, again, entitlement and privilege is everything. Uh, you know, we have to do a better job of looking at people's backgrounds and not just their demographics and their experience and understanding, you know, do they actually have, the have they act do they actually have the real life experiences that enables them to see the world through other people's eyes and i think that people like minister shandle just don't you know they've lived such privileged and entitled backgrounds that they have no capacity to understand how other people live their lives and how other people are affected yeah well i'm just thinking about myself if i were to track down a student that was critical of me and many students are very critical of me and i would show up at their house um you know and confront them i'm not sure i would have a job the next day yeah absolutely you know and like neither, just... of, neither of us would right you know this is why like you know you know when i was younger i'd get into like you know facebook battles with people and arguments and things like that but you know at some point you get did you? Time. oh yeah yeah you know <laughs> How now, I prefer you to, did now i prefer now to you have fight with me <laughs> now I prefer to have my arguments in person, right? No, the yeah. difference is the reason why you and I can argue and debate, right, is because you and I, you and I have a similar um, understanding of the situation, right? So for me to argue about somebody, you know, to start taking on a nurse or a doctor about their situation and start attacking them online or in person is ludicrous. I have mm -hmm. no understanding what their lives are like, I have no, especially right now. Right. The pressure they're under, you know, one of my friends is a nurse. Right. And one of my friends is a doctor. And the fact that, you know, right now they're undressing in their laundry rooms and showering and stuff before they come into their house. You know, my my friend who's a nurse, she's like, yeah, like probably next week she won't be able to go see her children and her family because they're starting mm -hmm. to get cases in her in her ER, in her hospital. They're starting to get cases of COVID. So she can't even go home to see her family. Like, can I compare myself to that? Right? No, absolutely not. Yeah. Right. So. 
that's what the problem is, right? Is this, uh, just we keep electing leaders, you know, and I said the same thing about Trudeau and Brownface. Like, you know, we shouldn't be surprised. Like, what evidence have we ever had that he understands the life of people of color other than he says he does, right? And this is the same thing with like people like Minister Shandro. He has no idea what people who are living on the front lines, people who live paycheck to paycheck, you know, what kind of strain they're under. Mm hmm Yep. All but right. Keep in mind, you know, like none of our elected officials' salaries are at risk, Andrew. Well, they went on with uh, with the uh, increase, right? With the uh, yep. yearly scheduled salary increase, Actually, and there was not there... much uh, noise around it. And I would have expected a little bit more, but apparently that was just yeah, so can silently. They, can they relate mess. to us? Can they can they relate to us? You know, maybe that's why Doug Ford is having an easier time to relate to us, right? Because this, his experience is closer to you know what he says that he is a man of the people, right? Versus you know, can Trump relate to anybody? You know, can no. you know someone who's been a, a career politician re relate to what are or, or pe people who have lost their livelihood right now when you're still guaranteed your paycheck no matter what happens mm. yes that's a good question to ask okay i will open it up to the audience for those who are here still watching just some questions when it comes to this what do you want to cost najib he's running to the next meeting so next time we are doing this we should do it around three o'clock or so I will see. Sure, yeah. We'll find a we'll find a time where everybody's up. Just write your type your questions in, and Najib will answer them. Um, anything else that we haven't touched upon that you um, want to touch? No, I mean you know I I encourage everybody to you know keep a close look at what kind of supports are being uh, announced and not be you know. Um, basically tricked into thinking things like deferrals or actual support. Okay. I know that yeah. right now they look good when we're, you mm. know, we're trying to reach for any, any uh, lifeboat in a storm, right. That, you know, Oh, let's defer our utilities and our mortgage and stuff, you know, but you know, at the end of the day, those, those um, cows are going to come home to roost. So of course, speak, right. Because that interest now that you're the deferral time, you're going to pay that interest. Plus you're going to play the interest on those payments later on. Right. So those aren't supports. Right. Um, and the, and keep a close eye on how quickly, you know, we're finding money to bail out corporations. Right. So I think that, you know, right now, you know, I'm really tired of seeing our city council, you know, come up on, on social media and talk to and keep explaining social isolation and how to wash mm. my hands to me. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. I need to know what you're doing. And I told, like I said, I understand it's only been a few weeks. Things take time. But we need to know, you talk about transparency. You know what we need to know, Andreas? What are they working on? Right? So tell me right now that you are working with a utility company. You own 100% of EPCOR. Are you telling me you can't do something for us in terms of utility payments? You own 100%. Uh, 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 EPCOR is under your purview, under our city council's purview. Like, you, know, you go on the website and they say, oh, we're talking to the province about utility deferrals. Are you joking? You know, mm -hmm. other cities in, in North America have already done that. They've already forgiven utility payments and told utility companies that they can't charge uh, residents, right, for utilities for, you know, whatever time period that they've, they've allocated. And our government is still saying we're talking to the province about it. Like, is that a joke? What, what they're saying is, oh, if the province gives us money, then we'll do it. Right? Yeah. It's ridiculous, right? And, you know, and, and, and that's all I've seen. All I've seen from both our, our city and our province is talk about loans and deferrals, which are not going to help us. The last thing citizens need is more debt. Exactly. And I think many of them do not realize that they were going to pay compounded interest on anything that they will be deferred. And that's a very important consideration. Yeah, never right? mind the fact that how irresponsible it is for our government to send us emails and messages celebrating the fact that banks are allowing us six months of deferral. First of all, I can get a deferral anytime I want. Okay. If you mm. go to your bank at any time in any situation oh, yeah, and you're in good standing with your and bank and you, you ask get for six a months deferral, deferrals. you ask for a deferral on mortgage or car payments, they will give it to you because they prefer yes. that than you default. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's freaking ridiculous that my government keeps telling me how amazing my bank is to give me six months of deferral where actually they're actually making more money off my back. Right? Yes. So that's With the it's bad. Compounded it's, interest. it's bad enough that the banks are telling me that my government is telling me that is ridiculous. That's a huge betrayal of our confidence. Right. What they should be telling us, us is this is how this is what we're doing. The UK labor uh, labor leader, I think, said an announcement about and talked about and was open about how he feels like corporations, banks should be funding citizens right now and later on. I mean, the fact is, and I've already come to terms with this, we're going to bail out all these guys. We're going to bail out insurance mm -hmm. companies, banks, 
airlines, et cetera, et cetera. You know how quickly they were able to put in a, a freeze rent for uh, airlines at airport authorities? You know what? Our rent hasn't been frozen, right? Mm -hmm. But already airlines don't have to pay rent at airport authorities because the federal government has frozen it, right? How quickly, mm -hmm. how quick was that, right? So fine, we're going to bail out all these industries. In the meantime, it should be those large corporations and those and, and banks that should be financing the government to find provincial supports for us at interest free loan with interest free loans. Later on, we'll bail them out. We'll happily pay the taxes that it's required for in, in able to bail out these these corporations, which is going to happen anyway. So we might as well, you know, not pretend that it isn't. But in the meantime, these come. You know, are you joking? We're just we just handed Amazon a large contract for shipping in this country. Is Canada Post not available? They're too busy. What you know? I don't understand why Amazon, who you know is is being um, uh, shown in the in in the press by all accounts that they don't take care of their workers. They're not providing paid sick leave. They're not protecting their workers, and they hoard wealth. You know, they have what a trillion dollars in reserve or something ridiculous like that. We're providing them these huge contracts. They're not even a Canadian company. You know, so stop talking to me about I should support local. I'm also tired of my government officials telling me I should support local when you're handing out contracts to Amazon. Mm. Yep. And Amazon is like totally in a very advantageous position right now. So it's like Amazon is the winner of, of this crisis. It's such, it, you know, we have such a celebrity and, you know, culture, you know, stop celebrating that Ryan Reynolds gave $4,000 to our food bank. Nice. Thank you, Ryan. But I really, first of all, I because he likes Edmonton. Yeah, he said I he likes give, Edmonton. Yeah, you know what? Actually, in 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 better circumstances, all of us can give four thousand dollars to our food bank. So thank you, multimillionaire, for giving us four thousand dollars. We don't really. Jeff give a Bezos shit. gave how much? Hundred million? Or who cares? It's here? insignificant, and that's yeah. not what we need. We don't need philanthropy at this point from those people, do because at the end of the day, that's just a tax write off for them, right? What we mm. need them to do is empty their coffers. All this money that they've hoarded and accumulated by not paying their taxes, you know, it needs to, to be given to governments to give to the people. You'll get it back. Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll give you back your hordes of wealth with interest when everything's right sided again. We'll pay it through our taxes. We're happy to do that because I can't pay a tax, income tax or a consumption tax if I'm not working. So if I'm working, I'm happy to pay a 10% GST to pay you, you back. But in the meantime, How about like doing a, putting a little bit of skin in the game at this time and helping out the citizens and, the, and your customers? Exactly. Well, Amazon is not shipping anymore unless uh, it's an essential good that you have, uh, you have ordered, just FYI. So I've seen a lot of influencers complaining and lamenting that they're not getting their shampoo, their hair shampoo that they actually wanted. They have to wait now a month or two to get it. Uh, well, I hope everybody realizes how useless <laughs> and influencers are now. I mean, you know, I, I saw a great meme the other day. It's just like, where's yeah. those guys that were telling me I can make $4,000 a month working from home? <laughs> <laughs> I, those guys are pretty quiet now because like, I really need that. I really need for them to show yeah. me how I can make $4,000 a, uh, a day or whatever they claim working from home. <laughs> exactly. All right, Najib, let's continue next week. Uh, yeah. A lot will happen. Didn't we didn't have any week. questions? Uh, I we didn't have... write anything. So it's like I will, let, oh, I will, I will let you go and jump into it. Nobody has questions. If you do, this is your last moment to ask Najib a question. Um, and today I was too tired to they're disagree with you. Maybe, yeah, maybe we should tackle something. They're disappointed because we didn't fight enough. <laughs> I, we should tackle something more, um, you know, more controversial next week. Maybe, you know, in a new world order or something like that where we can. Actually, you know what? Um, I, w I would love to talk yes. about that. I, I would love to, that you and I kind of start speculating and projecting what we think that well, you know, we can, the, you world, know, let's do yeah, it. the world looks like. Uh, Absolutely, we can do it, especially now, you know, with China controlling successfully the narrative. Mm -hmm. And uh, the U.S. is basically the gift that keeps, uh, keeps on giving, right? And yep. so we can, we can definitely talk about it. I will prepare. I will have all my ammunition ready. Uh, okay. And you know what? You already know my take on, on many things because I've expressed sure. my, 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 my grievances in person, but I might... Uh, Also, here's a couple of questions. What can yes, we do oh, to push for, push that, for change? that change? How do you think global trade will change? Okay, for the first question, new world uh, order that comes next new, week. New world order. My <laughs> daughter's word, already, I would call it the new world disorder, but okay, yes. My, my daughter's already established a new world order in her house. She doesn't, she 
She's like, she's at full anarchy mode. She's like, she runs around naked all day and just tells me what to do. She doesn't recognize my authority anymore. In, in this um, yes. One of the things that I, you know, and I've said this before, one of the things that I think you, that our audience can do is start keeping a record Monitoring. of how, how our, com how the companies that you do business with, that you give your money to are behaving in these times and what they're doing for you in return how our leadership that you vote oh, for. Boris Johnson vote, is in vote. intensive care. He was yeah, just in the yeah. hospital yesterday. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there will be serious uh, complications. He, he didn't strike me as a person who is in top shape when it comes to health, right? So this could really set the United Kingdom back and it really could be a, a huge wake-up call if, if this goes, uh, you know, bad. Hey, listen, man, I hate to be the negative cynic, but... You know, the best thing that we have working for all of us, the fact is that this disease, disease affects everybody equally. We wouldn't definitely not, we definitely wouldn't be getting the same response if this only affected poor brown people in other countries. If this would be Ebola, right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> Ebola, well, there's been many, many cases, but, which yep. also speaks to the fact that those countries are able to react quickly, quickly and contain it the way they have because they, they kind of deal with this kind of stuff every year. If it isn't a natural disaster, it's a disease outbreak, etc. So they're what, better prepared. Yes. So I just want those who are still here, and I, I assume those who are still watching us are in their 20s, um, that this week a 28-year-old died, a female in Edmonton. So let's not forget that, um, you know, the, the original assumption that this only kills you if you're 80 and smoking, it doesn't hold true anymore. And we know very little about the ramifications of this disease, the long-term long effects, et cetera, et cetera. So millennials and Generation Z stay at home. Yep. It'll kill... What's going to kill you is carelessness at the end of the day. Yeah. That's what's going to kill you. So, yep, that's the assumption you have to make. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Beck, yes, we can watch and we can monitor those who are in charge. Absolutely. That's what I recommend. Right? I mean, you know, for all of us is to watch and monitor and keep track and, you know, make sure you take that into account the next time some, somebody calls you for your vote uh, mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, in our rush to get back our lives, our lives back to normal, we keep track of those things that we don't want to go back to uh, as they were. Um, and that's a big ask. And like I said, I mean, that becomes more relevant the longer this goes on. And, you know, you're also voting with your dollars or you're also voting with following somebody. So if you think yep. that somebody is tone deaf or, you know, totally out of line or a company is not behaving in a way that you expect them to behave in this pandemic, then you just stop purchasing their goods. Absolutely. And just remember, you know, Amazon is a faceless transaction, right, versus mm -hmm. You know, and I, mean, I, I really think that the longer this goes on, we're all going to look for more social interaction, not less. I don't, I think that, you know, this concept that people are just going to stay in their homes and work from home, et cetera, I don't think that's what's going to happen. I mean, I know myself personally and uh, is I'm dying for more social interaction and I'm dying to give my money and business to local businesses because I, how I've been personally affected by this, you know, I wasn't a big Amazon shopper to begin with. I'm going to make that next to zero uh, unless I have to in the future. Mm-hmm. All right, we, I will see you next week. And next week, we start with the new word disorder. Let's have that topic on. Let's do it. Are, are you ready for that? <laughs> I'm ready. I, we will fight. Uh, okay. okay, off I go. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you, Najib. Thanks, Andrew. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.